And if you want quantum computing to be very useful in the end, I believe we need to do a similar uh, evolution. You don't need to have a mathematical background to, uh, to read the book and to run the samples with the best classical computers. It's nearly impossible to break strong RSA encryption. Quantum computing is not, is not applicable to all kinds of problems. When will we have quantum computers? This is the, uh, the, the, the billion dollar question. This episode was made possible thanks to Gotopia.tech. So my name is Preben. I'm CTO at Trifork. And with me, I have Johan Foss, author of the brand new book, Quantum Computing in Action. And this is the Ghost Book Club. Welcome, Johan. Thank you very much for having me. In front of me here, I have a few books uh, about quantum computing. And I guess at least one of them, I would say, is, is a must read within our industry. But your book is different from all of the books here. Why and how? Well, I think the, um, there are a number of great books about quantum computing, and that's uh, uh, very important because the work on quantum computing could not be done so swiftly as it's been done now if there was no sharing of information. So many people are active in the area of uh, quantum computing, and they do different things. And if you look at how classical computing evolved, then in the early days, it was mainly about the hardware and about how to create a computer. And gradually, the focus uh, also moved to not just the hardware, but also the software. And then we had different uh, computer languages. And on top of the computer languages, we created new computer languages. And then we created software patterns and uh, new declarative uh, languages and so on. So the moment that the root problems are more or less under control, then people um, tend to go higher up the stack. And if you want quantum computing to be very useful in the end, I believe we need to do a similar uh, evolution. And that means that we have to slightly uh, add more focus to the software aspects of quantum computing, by which I mean, how can we deal with existing software uh, applications and still leverage quantum computing? So at this point, there are um, tens of millions of developers worldwide using different languages. And then the main question to me is, and that's what I try to address in the book, is how can we allow these millions of developers to take advantage of quantum computing without requiring them to, to get a PhD in quantum physics or so. So I really want the, uh, all those developers to be able to leverage all the great work by people that, that wrote the other books and that, um, that are working on different aspects of quantum computing. So you say there are tens, uh, tens of millions of developers out there working with different languages. You decided to go with Java here, why? Well, Java is the language that I'm uh, most familiar with, and it's uh, um, still one of the most popular languages in the uh, world. It's been uh, around for more than 25 years, and it's still around, so I think it's a, it's a safe bet for the future. There are other languages that, that, that come and go faster, and I want this book to, to have a long lifetime. So Java is in that sense a safe bet. It's also that there are about, well, on the last count, more than 12 million Java developers worldwide. And Java is used in many uh, critical enterprise applications. And it might seem strange that you want to, to use some, uh, well, to use an enterprise language for, some, for a topic that's mainly popular in research areas. But I think if we want, it, if we want quantum computing to succeed, it means that it has to reach the level of enterprise software and throughout the years, Java learned a lot from being used in the enterprise. So if we want, it, if we want quantum computing to be uh, leveraged in enterprise software, then it definitely helps to use it together with a language that knows all the in and outs of enterprise software, that knows how to deal with um, security, um, uh, scalability, uh, code maturity, and uh, that also has a large developer base. And um, 
those Java developers are very familiar with a number of concepts. And by bringing quantum computing to those concepts, um, I think we can give 12 million developers a kickstart. It's, um, th that is not to say that uh, there are no other languages that can benefit from, uh, from Java. And I definitely think that uh, um, uh, C, C++ or um, C Sharp or so are um, very good candidates as well. Python is obviously a great language to do research with quantum computing. But if we really want to bridge the gap between research and enterprise software, then I think Java is a, is a safe bet. If we draw a line back to the books I mentioned before, they seem to be uh, centered uh, around the cross field between math and physics, maybe even philosophy. May I ask, what is your background? Um, I have a... I have a master of science in uh, civil engineering. Actually, I'm a mining engineer and I have a PhD in um, applied physics, uh, which was done at the Faculty of Aerospace uh, Engineering. So my master of science is uh, uh, um, deep under the ground and my PhD is uh, high above the ground. So that's, uh, um, that's funny and it actually means that um, it's, um, that I, my background is in combining different uh, things. And when I started to do my PhD, uh, that was on the um, acoustic wave theory, then I needed to, well, to do lots of calculations because there was lots of data and I needed to do um, strong visualizations of this data. So I was searching for a language that could help me with this. And right at that moment, Java was uh, released. So I looked into Java and um, I wanted to do this on my uh, Linux uh, stations. There was no Java for Linux then. So I joined uh, a small group called the Blackdown team and reported Java to Linux. And that's how I got in software. So I, I turned into software because I needed it for my uh, scientific research. And um, yeah, then I got um, yeah, stuck in the software world and uh, I rolled from uh, one um, challenge into the other, um, mainly software related. But the um, the background, the real background on why I wanted to do this, uh, to be able to process scientific data and to visualize it and to to move things forward, that is something that I always um, liked. And uh, with this uh, book about quantum computing and with the strange quantum computing simulator that I uh, wrote, I think I've gone uh, uh, full circle. So you ported Java to Linux. We we need to have a conversation about that one day. Uh, sticking to your book, how much physics, how much math do I need to read it and to understand it? Yeah, that, that's a good that's a good question, and it's a question that uh, um, I was asking myself every um, ev every other week or so because. Um, when I started the book, Manning wanted to have the description of the what they call the, uh, I think, MQR. Uh, it is MQR, and I think it stands for Minimal uh, Qualified Reader. So what does the reader need to know? And um, I know that the if, if the basic requirements from a mathematical point uh, double, then the uh, potential reader target will be divided by four or so. So I... I tried to avoid the uh, mathematical requirements and not just because um, I want to have more readers, but also because I don't think it's, um, it does matter to most of the developers. So um, you don't need to have a mathematical background to, uh, to read the book and to run the samples. Um, you don't need to know um, much about uh, uh, physics, definitely not about quantum physics. But for the interested reader, um, there is more background in the book about why are things the way they are. So for some developers, it doesn't matter. They just say, okay, so with this algorithm, I can search through a long unstructured list in polynomial time, for example, um, which is not entirely uh, true. But And for others, they want to know why is this uh, um, quantum approach much faster than the classical approach? And then it is explained uh, with some very basic mathematics. 
but we don't go deep into the mathematical details. Um, in order to, to write a book and the software behind it, I had to deep dive into the mathematics and the physics myself. And that's actually the best way to learn it. As uh, um, I just read another tweet from a, uh, well, the Richard Feynman uh, Twitter account where um, he says, if you want to understand something, then teach it. So um, there is some, if, if, if you really want to deep dive into the algorithms in the book, then the book will also help you with the mathematics, but it's, it's not required. And I think that for many Java developers or many enterprise developers, they are interested in it, but they, um, yeah, mer uh, mainly I think as, yeah, something that they do out of interest and not because they need it to, to get a job done. I completely agree. The best way to learn is to teach. Yes. Uh, let's dive a little bit into the materia of the book. What is polynomial time? What is exponential time? Yeah, so that's uh, um, that is one of the uh, major um, aspects of quantum computing that it can deal with uh, uh, problems. Some problems that um, uh, uh, would typically take exponential time that uh, quantum computing can deal in polynomial time. So to to try to explain it briefly, if you have a problem and you have an algorithm that will solve the problem, um, then uh, typically the bigger the problem, the longer it will take before you have a solution. Uh, for example, if I have to sort um, 10 numbers from high to low, um, it will take some time. If I have 100 numbers, that will obviously take much more time than uh, solving the 10 numbers. And the, the amount by which problems become more complex if the number of uh, um, if the input parameters become uh, uh, larger, that is um, expressed in, um, in, in the time uh, uh, order of that uh, uh, problem. And there are some problems um, that take exponent that are of exponential time uh, with the best known classical algorithms, which means that, if you have a classical computer and he can solve um, a given problem in um, two minutes, then by making the problem three times as hard, the, it will require, um, for example, eight times more uh, uh, time. And by making it four times as hard, it might require 16 times more uh, time. I think most people uh, by now understand what an exponential, what exponential behavior is um, because of the uh, coronavirus. Um, unfortunately, also um, uh, multiplicate itself uh, in uh, using exponential behavior. And, and we, uh, unfortunately, we, um, most people now realize that if something seems to go slow in the beginning, it can go extremely fast uh, when things get more complex. This is a bad example of uh, exponential behavior, but a good example uh, is, for example, in cryptography. When we want to um, create uh, cryptography keys, then we see that if we make them very small, it's easy to hack them. But if we add a few bits, then it becomes harder and harder, and it becomes exponentially harder. So that is an, uh, a problem that um, we can, uh, I'm making some shortcuts here, but that we can um, define as uh, exponential time behavior. Now, on a quantum computer, some of those uh, non-polynomial problems um, might be executed still in polynomial time, which means that we make the problem harder uh, and the quantum computer will need more time to solve it, but not exponentially more time. It might take more, um, it might, for example, if we, might, if we make the problems four times as hard, it might take eight times more uh, time, but if we make it Eight times as hard, and it might take only 16 times uh, the original time. So it will still become more complex, but it won't behave like, like this exponential curve that we um, all know so well uh, now. And that is a that is a game changer because um, some problems are known to be um, of exponential complexity, 
And they cannot be solved with even the biggest supercomputers in the world, even if all the um, classical computing power is combined. Um, those problems are too hard to solve. And a, class and a quantum computer might be able to solve these um, very, very hard uh, problems. And the, the typical example of this is uh, encryption. I want to stress that this is a very important uh, uh, example, but it's definitely not the only um, application of quantum computing. But with the best classical computers, it's nearly impossible to break strong RSA encryption. But with a quantum computer, um, it, um, it is possible once the quantum computers are um, powerful enough, which may take a long, long time. And more important, by adding a few bits, the, the classical problem would become exponentially more complex. But in quantum computing, just adding a few bits is not going to make you exponentially uh, more secure. So that's a... That's a um, it's, it, it's a thing that's hard to explain, but um, I, I, and therefore I use the example of uh, uh, encryption and the coronavirus because I think that people can somehow understand what it means if a problem is exponential. And I think it's important to emphasize that a quantum computer is a calculator. It's not just a supercomputer, it's a calculator, and it's very suited for a specific type of mathematical problems. So the idea is that you have this problem with uh, with a huge complexity. It can kind of transfer it or turn it around, move it into the quantum space, and then it becomes solvable for the quantum computer. And in order to do that, we need to understand about quantum gates, for instance. What, what is a gate? What is a quantum gate? All right, so just like a, a classical computer consists of a, a number of gates, a quantum computer consists of gates as well. So in classical computing, um, uh, well, the high-level programming languages are built on top of low-level languages and uh, on machine uh, coding. And ultimately, it's based on uh, the flow of current that uh, passes or not passes through a transistor. And the gates there are then, for example, the NOT gate that will invert uh, the zero into one and vice versa or an AND gate, uh, X uh, uh, OR gate, and so on. And in quantum computing, um, we have, uh, sim uh, we have uh, gates as well. So that, uh, that concept um, can somehow be compared to the concept of uh, uh, classical uh, gates. The, the main difference, though, uh, between quantum computing and classical computing is that in classical computing, we use bits uh, where a bit can have the value zero or one. Zero means no uh, current, and one means uh, 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 maybe five voltage or so. And in quantum computing, we don't use bits, but we use uh, qubits, where a qubit can hold the value of uh, zero. It can hold the value of one, but it can also hold a linear combination of zero and one. So, and that's not to say that it can be, for example, zero dot seven. It actually means that when I would measure this qubit, there's maybe 30% chance that I will measure a zero and 70% chance that I will measure a one. So you can measure zero or you can measure one, but you don't, uh, but whereas in classical computing, it's always uh, clear that it's either one or the other. And in quantum computing, we talk more about probabilities. And um, the gates that operate in quantum computers uh, deal with these probabilities. And therefore, if you apply a gate to a qubit, the result is, uh, well, the qubit is uh, uh, still there. But instead of just um, two uh, states, the qubit can be in uh, many uh, uh, states. And that makes the gates uh, a bit more tricky to uh, create in quantum computing than in uh, uh, classical computing. But it also offers for um, yeah, great um, well performance improvements because what you said uh, is exactly the point. Um, quantum computers are no supercomputers. It's not that they do uh, more calculations. It's just that um, they are able to do, and this is scientifically um, not really um, uh, correct, but they are able to do um, uh, many computations 
uh, in parallel. So a quantum gate needs to be reversible. Is that a quantum mechanical property or is it more like a definition that we have made? No, it's actually what uh, nature dictates us. And um, that is another important difference between quantum gates and classical gates. Um, a classical gate is uh, uh, more or less, well, human-made. So um, we created, um, in particle terms, a, a huge device named the transistor, which is uh, a few uh, uh, nanometers. But it's, uh, uh, it's huge compared to the, um, uh, to the world of the, um, of the very small particles. And um, the, the elements that we have in quantum computing are the elementary particles. And in quantum mechanics, um, everything is reversible. So there is no, um, um, well, it's because of the laws of uh, uh, quantum uh, mechanics that um, the equations hold in both time directions. And as a consequence, if you want to use the fundamental cornerstones of nature to create a computer, whatever we do there must be reversible as well because the elements that we use are reversible. So if we are thinking about uh, a gate, we have to take into account that if we want to create this gate with um, uh, building blocks from, uh, from nature, that the gate needs to be reversible, otherwise we, we can't construct it. And that is a, um, it, it is a challenge because it makes some gates harder. For example, a classical gate, an AND gate has two inputs and one output. But we can't have that in quantum computing because if we then have the outputs, we can't go back to the two inputs because there are many, uh, uh, well, in the case of uh, two input bits and one output bit, and if one of the input bits is zero, the other is one, the output is going to be one. But you can't go back and say that the first input was one or the second input was one. That information is lost if you apply the classical gate. So therefore, that is something that that gate is impossible to realize in uh, uh, quantum uh, computing. Uh, of course, you can do arithmetic in quantum computing, but then you need uh, slightly different gates um, with two output uh, qubits, uh, for example, where the second qubit um, has the information that otherwise would have been uh, lost. And I need to say to, to the viewers here that all of this may sound very abstract. But trust me, if you read the book, it all makes sense. But talking about the gates, um, it leads me into another question, and that is the oracle. What is, what is an oracle? Um, apart from being a software company, um, an oracle is uh, um, very relevant in um, uh, quantum computing because it is um, sort of... Um, what I call a quantum black box. It is something that is given to you by someone else or by um, uh, a phenomenon in uh, nature or so, and you don't know what is inside it. And you actually are not interested what is inside it, but you want to know its characteristics. And you can't open that black box, but you can query it, which means you can um, provide some input and you can measure the output. So in a quantum oracle, when you, um, when you know that quantum oracle, for example, has five input qubits and also five output qubits, you can um, try uh, different combinations of qubits and you can then measure what that oracle gives as an output. And based on uh, the um, input-output uh, parameters, you can more or less uh, understand what is happening inside that uh, quantum uh, oracle. And um, that is, well, comparable with the black box. And uh, a basic example uh, for this, um, which uh, we discuss in the book as well, is suppose that you have a classical function that will um, always be either balanced or constant, which means that um, suppose that, well, that, that will either give in half of the times as the result of uh, an operation a zero, and in half of the times it will give a one. In that case, we call that a balanced function. And a constant function is when it will always give a zero or it will always uh, give a one. 
So we are, we are given a function, but we don't know is this a constant or a balanced uh, function. And suppose that we have uh, um, eight different uh, input scenarios, then we need to do at least five evaluations of this black box function before we can tell with certainty if this is a, uh, or if the black box is hiding a constant or a balanced function. Five evaluations because uh, after four evaluations, we might um, still have um, four times zero, but it can be that the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eight will give a one, in which case it is a constant, uh, it is a balanced uh, function. And with a quantum oracle, uh, you can create a, a quantum oracle that's uh, um, mimicking this classical function, but you can prove that you need only one evaluation to, um, well, actually, well, if, if you have two qubits, it's one evaluation and, and it, uh, it adds to that. But um, you need, um, the, the, the thing is that in quantum computing, you can send, um, instead of trying first uh, all zeros and then L zeros uh, and one one and then uh, different combinations, you can send uh, more or less all combinations at the same time by putting the qubits in what is called a superposition, which is the qubits then have uh, as value a linear combination of zero and one. So they um, they can be measured as zero or they can be measured as one. If all those qubits are in a superposition and you send them to the oracle, then the oracle is, um, and again, this is scientifically, I uh, I know that if there are um, uh, real scientists uh, listening that they might say, no, it's uh, uh, it's not really happening, but it's, I try to make it visually more comprehensible by taking some shortcuts. Uh, so um, I would say that you can compare it that the Oracle is um, evaluating all the possibilities at once and it will then give one outcome. So it is, um, and that's where the, uh, the speed up uh, uh, comes from. Um, instead of evaluating all zeros and then all ones or so, it evaluates all options at, uh, uh, simultaneously. And that is, uh, um, that is why a quantum oracle is often used um, for dealing with uh, complex uh, applications because you can uh, understand what is happening inside the quantum oracle by feeding it a specific um, uh, configuration of qubits where superposition is extremely uh, important. And trust me, once again, all of this makes sense once you, you read the book. And I'm going to leave this as a cliffhanger here, that this is very important for one of the most famous algorithms, Grover's search algorithm, understanding quantum oracles. And all of this has been supported beautifully by, by the examples, by the code examples in the book, which leads me to your claim pretty early in the book that by using this quantum simulator, we will be able to write programs. And the day we have quantum hardware, it's pretty much just changing a variable, and then it runs on the re on real hardware. Is that really so? Yes, absolutely. And that was uh, uh, one of the most important design goals. Um, and I think it is extremely important, and it is very well possible now because of the long history that we have with classical computing and with computer languages uh, like Java. With in in, in Java. You do not program against a specific implementation, but you program against uh, uh, APIs and interfaces. So a Java developer uses the top level Java APIs to write an application. And it does not matter then if that application is ultimately being executed on a Windows system or a Mac or a Linux or an embedded device or a mobile device or so. It's under the hood. Um, the, the, instructions from the developer are translated into the low-level machine-specific instructions. And this holds with uh, Strange as well, the uh, quantum simulator that uh, I wrote. So it will, by default, search for the quantum simulator that it's bundled with, but you can also run your application on, uh, on a different execution environment, which is uh, called the quantum execution environment. And those execution environments will translate the um, your application into something that's specific for a specific 
um, uh, execution environment. And that an execution environment can be a real quantum computer, which I don't have right now. Uh, but it can also be a quantum simulator that is running on your uh, local desktop, or it can be a quantum simulator that is running in the cloud. And that is um, what makes it uh, powerful and future-proof, that the moment that a real quantum computer is available, your application does not need to change because the gates that your application is using have representations in both simulators, cloud uh, computers, as well as uh, real-world uh, quantum uh, computers. So that is actually the the uh, the root idea of uh, Java was uh, Bora, why it runs to run anywhere. And that is what we bring uh, now to, um, to quantum computing as well. And um, that is not extremely new, uh, by the way. Um, one of the other projects that I'm, I'm, I'm the quality of the OpenJFX uh, uh, project in the uh, Java world where we define uh, the Java APIs for user interfaces. And um, the implementation of, uh, of that project will use the uh, a GPU, if there's a GPU available on the device that you're using, um, your laptop or, um, uh, or desktop or phone or so. And if there's no GPU, it will use um, the CPU and will do software emulation. And that, that principle is exactly the same as what we do in Strange with uh, quantum uh, computing. So we could search if there is a uh, real uh, quantum processor. And if so, we are going to use it. And otherwise, we use the uh, software fallback or so. So that is uh, um, yeah, something that we learned by doing uh, software many, many years and that we can now leverage to make quantum computing already possible even before we have real physical uh, quantum computers, which is extremely important in my opinion that we start working on quantum computing now and not just wait till the moment that there are many powerful quantum computers. That's, that would actually be my next question, because you kind of revealed that we don't have the quantum computers yet. Uh, so why why should we care now? Yeah, there are a couple of reasons uh, uh, for it. And I think it's important to realize that even, um, even if you're extremely smart, it will still take a while before you come up with um, the best ways to introduce quantum computing in your applications. It is a totally new way of thinking. You need to think in, in a different way than you uh, think when solving classical problems. And you need to um, understand when quantum computing can be applicable and when it is not applicable. So that's also something I want to make clear. Quantum computing is not is not applicable to all kinds of problems. So there are definitely problems that will uh, that the quantum computer will never be able to um, to solve in a good way. So to find out which parts of uh, your existing or new software should benefit from quantum computing, that is going to take time. And um, and time is uh, um, uh, might be critical. For example, if it's not certain yet, but if quantum computers will one day be able to crack RSA uh, uh, encryption, then you don't want to wait until that point before you start uh, looking into your uh, encryption. You can use uh, quantum computing to create secure communication, and you, but, but you, you can't switch overnight. For example, if, if it's uh, uh, announced, and I don't think there will be a big announcement when a company or a, a government or a nation um, has a powerful quantum computer that can break uh, RSA encryption. And the next morning, your encryption is not using uh, classical uh, encryption standards anymore, but is using a uh, quantum encryption. That, that's going to take a long, long time. And uh, even if it's going to take a long time before quantum computers can do that, it will also take a long time before uh, your organization will be ready for it. And I often compare that with the, uh, the Y2K bug, the Millennium bug, where it was clear that uh, at December 31, 1999, that there would be a problem. And uh, companies didn't wait until December 26, 1999. At least most companies didn't wait. Uh, some waited a bit too long, but most were prepared ahead of time. And that effort started years in advance. And it was actually very needed. 
And the reason that we have that we didn't see many problems with the Y2K bug is because because that because of exactly this companies prepared started to prepare years in advance, um, investigated their existing software, um, searched for vulnerabilities, and came up with uh, solutions ahead of time. There was the advantage of well, you could predict very well when the millennium, millennium bug would uh, happen. It's a bit harder to predict uh, when um, quantum computers will be uh, powerful enough to to break uh, uh, encryption. But it's not only a negative story, it's also a positive uh, story. So imagine that there are quantum computers powerful enough to do great things in uh, uh, medicine, healthcare, chemistry, or physics. And so uh, you don't want to wait until that moment before you start thinking about and how can I then write software that will take advantage of this? So therefore, it's already good to start thinking about the software now and uh, start writing algorithms um, and run them on a very small scale or on a, a quantum simulator or so. Because if you can uh, prove that the new algorithm on a quantum computer will require polynomial time instead of exponential time, as we discussed in the beginning, then you know that you're on the right track and then you know that once quantum computers are there that um, your software will be very, very uh, usable. So it's uh, uh, there's no reason why this software research cannot be done in parallel with the hardware evolutions. And if you want to get a, a head start um, for when quantum computers are really available, then you better start yesterday working on the software. So let's stop circling around the big question. Let's go into it. When, when will we have quantum computers? I keep circling around. It's uh, uh, this is the, uh, the 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 billion dollar question. Um, well, actually, the answer is uh, um, uh, the unfair answer is easy. We already have quantum computers today. So there are a number of quantum computers. Uh, uh, IBM even has uh, a few quantum computers in a public cloud that you can access. Um, uh, Google has a, a quantum computer. Um, and then there are when, when we have useful quantum computers. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah, so this is the point where I will be crucified uh, uh, later probably. But I, I think... Um, between five and 10 years from now, we will have quantum computers that uh, will really be able to solve problems that um, that are uh, totally unsolvable uh, today. And uh, um, that will be um, very, um, um, yeah, that will um, be complete game changers. But between now and then, there will be um, other um, applications of quantum computing that um, will be very useful. And I personally think that in the not-too-distance uh, future, we will be able to benefit from the quantum internet. Um, and that combined with um, small quantum computers can drastically change the way we think about encryption. And, uh, for example, at Delft University of Technology, there is a consortium working on the quantum internet where um, entangled qubits are um, sent to two different uh, computers. So even if those computers are very small quantum computers, because they are connected um, with each other on a quantum internet, they might become more powerful. And especially there are many things that you can do even with just a few qubits. So I think that it won't take five years before we are going to see practical applications uh, on a limited scale of uh, quantum computing. The big things, uh, like for for example, um, solving the uh, uh, um, uh, protein folding uh, problem or um, breaking RSA encryption, that's gonna take more than five years, I think. But you never know what's um, what's going to be invented, and that is also one of the main reasons why I really want all those tens of millions of developers to uh, look into quantum computing and to learn about it because maybe one of these um, readers has an idea and says, hey, but if we can, if we can actually find the uh, 
periodicity of a function with uh, this algorithm, we may also find, we also might use this for this or this problem, and that will then be a dramatic uh, boost in um, uh, in some material design or in some uh, uh, medical uh, investigation. And so, so it's a uh, uh, it's a new world, the world of uh, quantum algorithms, and um, the more people that are uh, working on this, uh, the better. And um, if uh, some of these problems require uh, thousands or millions of qubits, but maybe some require uh, can be useful with less uh, qubits. And I be I believe that there will be problems that will be um, well that will lead to immediate benefits without having um, without requiring millions of qubits. Thank you. It has been so inspiring speaking with you, and just as is as inspiring reading your book. Thanks a lot. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for uh, having me here. Subscribe to the Go to YouTube channel now and join the experts in person or online at any upcoming Go to conference using the promo code Book Club. Visit gotopia.tech to learn more.